More and more capital for a just and sustainable world sounds like a good idea. So this panel I'm very excited for. There were two huge announcements in the impact investing world this year from Bain Capital and from BlackRock. These major financial institutions are making big commitments to impact investing. But I think that's raised a lot of confusion from folks in the field trying to understand what that means and what we can expect, what the timelines are. We thought you might want to hear from them directly. So we've got Brian Trellstad from Bridges Ventures interviewing Deval Patrick of Bain Capital and Deborah Winchell from BlackRock. Please welcome them. Good morning. I'm Brian Trellstead, a partner at Bridges Ventures, and it's a delight to be here to talk about impact investing going mainstream. When I was at Acumen Fund we in 2009, we were thrilled at the prospect of raising $100 million to invest in emerging markets businesses serving the base of the pyramid. We thought that was real scale. Today, I'm proud to be part of a, a fund manager, Bridges Ventures, which m manages roughly a billion dollars investing funds in real estate, growth equity, and social sector entirely dedicated to impact and sustainable investment. But sitting on stage next to a $75 billion asset manager, Bain Capital, and a $4.7 trillion, that is trillion with a T, asset manager in BlackRock, it puts scale in perspective. So, so no two better people to talk about impact investing going mainstream than Governor Deval Patrick at Bain Capital and Deborah Winchell from BlackRock. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me start with you, Governor Patrick. Um, you had a distinguished career in public service. You were the governor of Massachusetts. You were a senior executive in corporate America. Um, after leaving the State House in January of this year, you could have done anything. Why did you choose impact investing? <laughs> well, first of all, can I just make clear? I am not responsible for all $75 billion at Bank yeah. Capital. We're, we're just standing up a new, a new fund. But um, I would say sort of philosophically that uh, I feel fortunate to have, um, like most people, want, in search of, uh, of meaning in their lives, uh, to understand that for me to have meaning in my life, I had to have meaning in my work. And uh, the jobs I have, uh, I have had in the main have been very meaningful, and I wanted that to, uh, to continue. Your colleague and my mentor, uh, Ronald Cohen, introduced me uh, to this field, um, starting with uh, social impi impact bonds when I was in office. Uh, and uh, and migrating, if you will, to impact investing was natural. Uh, very serendipitous that the platform happens to be uh, uh, Bain Capital and huge fun and opportunity in that, but that's a longer story. And Deborah, how about you? You were, uh, started your career in investment banking. You were the CFO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You were then the president of the Robin Hood Foundation. How did you come to, to BlackRock and impact investing? Well, I, th I would say with a lot of luck, uh, I really can't believe that I'm having the opportunity to bring all this together at BlackRock. I, I started, uh, I went to business school um, already with an eye on how do you bring together discipline and analytics to social impact. And being a, uh, a classic humanities uh, major in college, I knew nothing about business or analytics. So after business school, I went into finance really with the intention of how do you learn to think about businesses in a more disciplined and sort of outcome-oriented way, and then uh, never left or didn't leave for a very long time. And then at the Met, it was a great opportunity to help a mission-driven organization align its mission with financial in out outcomes. And as everybody in this room knows, even if you're mission-driven, you have to have a model that's sustainable. Um, going to to Robin Hood was uh, a, an incredible education around metrics. And how do you use metrics to measure things that are very difficult to measure, like poverty fighting? And I think it's with that lens and that background that I have the opportunity to come to a BlackRock and look at what is very traditional investment management and think about how can you balance two objectives at the same time. Now, BlackRock is about as mainstream as it gets with roughly 6% of the world's professionally managed capital. Um, and yet it's still a relatively entrepreneurial firm. Can you tell us the story of how impact investing within BlackRock got launched and what your focus is right now? Yeah, I, I love how it got launched and it was one of the reasons that I was drawn so much to BlackRock. We had, the, the whole area of engagement and 
um, responsible investing is very deep in BlackRock's DNA. It's been one of the um, largest sort of um, engagement firms in many years. It has a group that's been uh, of 20 people who just spend time looking at ESG factors and thinking about how to vote our proxies. But uh, in addition to that, there was a group of millennials uh, at BlackRock who had been on their own researching impact investing, understanding the field, put together a business plan, went to our leadership and presented it and got the sponsorship of our senior leaders to think about this in a more organized sort of business platform way. And that's when I came in. So really building on the back of an initiative that was very grassroots, even at BlackRock. Mm -hmm. Great. And today, high level, some of the thoughts about where you're heading? Sure. I, you know, I, we look at this business, we look at this sector uh, very broadly. We have tremendous respect and admiration for so many firms. I know, you know, we, we were just talking about who've been doing this for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, we come at it in a different way. We, we, you know, it's a very large ecosystem and we think there's an opportunity to look across all asset classes, the public markets, the private markets, and really bring some definition, transparency, some measurement, to a lot of areas of asset classes that don't really have anything in this, in this area. And so, you know, using very clear definitions, helping clients, both institutional and retail, think about the motivations, what is it they'd like to achieve, and what are some potential solutions, some of which I hope BlackRock offers, and I think many of which many people in this firm, uh, in this room, will be offering as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how we feel this whole area can be more mainstream by getting clients and investors comfortable. How do you define this world? What are the different segments? What's available in the public markets that's liquid? What great opportunities might be more accessible now in the private markets? So that's the approach we're mm -hmm. taking. Great. And Governor, when you first started having conversations with the partners at Bain, what motivated them to think about raising an impact investment fund? Uh, existing limiteds had been asking. Uh, you know, I was, I, I had friends at, uh, at Bain Capital and I was just in sort of soundboarding with them ideas that I, uh, that I had, frankly, in very other, very different uh, spaces. And, uh, and one of the senior partners leaned forward and said, actually, we've been trying to figure out how to get into impact investing for a few years now. And they were having a conversation at the time about acquiring a, an impact fund of funds from a bank that was having, for a variety of reasons, to uh, uh, divest itself. They asked if I was interested in coming in and helping with that, and I said, actually, no, because well, I'm interested in direct investing. Um, and uh, one thing led to another, and they said, okay, let's do impact, let's do direct investing, come in and help us build the, uh, build the business. And we've resolved now to um, essentially do a, uh, a private equity fund that would do uh, investments, growth capital, and uh, control investments in lower middle market uh, firms in North America operating in three areas, in sustainability, in health and wellness, and in something we're calling neighborhood revitalization. Uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to rolling that out formally, probably first quarter next year. We're busy uh, putting the team together now. Great. Yeah. What, what were some of the biggest arguments against the idea or internal debate about uh, either the strategy or whether this was a good idea? Can I don't you think share there were any it? arguments against. I think we, were, we found ourselves very aligned on a couple of uh, things, and I realize there's a range of view in this room, um, but uh, that, first of all, that uh, a competitive market-based private equity style return was important to deliver. Um, and while I respect that there are folks along the spectrum uh, uh, there at, uh, at Bain Capital and personally, um, I think that's important for a whole host of, uh, whole host of reasons. We were focused very much on deal flow. Where were the real opportunities? to come to scale um, because uh, part of mainstreaming, I think, from our perspective is how do you help a mission-driven enterprise, which is also a for-profit enterprise, um, demonstrate that it can operate at, uh, uh, at scale and with all of the considerations that entrepreneurs um, uh, always have about ex exits and liquidity and for themselves and their, uh, and their investors, but also how you have mission lock mm -hmm. um, and can you find someone uh, in a secondary market, which I think, frankly, does not exist in this space today, um, who is going to be as respectful of the mission as, uh, as of, the, uh, uh, of the financials. So I think we're actually quite aligned, and we've worked in an iterative process to where 
what the size of the first one should be and what the um, uh, speed with which we should be trying thoughtfully to uh, deploy um, uh, those assets and what the timing of the second and third funds might be. And Deborah, so much of impact investing is private capital, venture capital, private equity, um, and yet BlackRock is a leader in public equity fixed income. Um, I'm just curious how you're thinking, you've talked a little bit about this, but how you're deploying these capabilities and how you see impact investing moving to the mainstream from institutional investors only towards individual, um, the, the retail investor. Right. I think one of the ways that we're hoping we can help uh, sort of broaden the market for uh, these kinds of investments is just clarity about what it is we're offering. So first of all, we're looking across all asset classes and we're looking at them in three ways. We're, you know, we're called BlackRock Impact, but it's really about sustainable investing and we have a long history of business in screens, you know, just excluding companies or industries because of values or missions of clients. We have a pretty deep um, existing uh, practice around ESG, and we think there are a lot of opportunities to help clients marry ESG considerations, how companies operate with financial return. And then that last category of impact, where we very much view it as, here's your financial outcome, here's your impact outcome, measurement, reporting, transparency, and taking that model and bringing that across asset classes. So for example, we're about to launch a product, or maybe we did just launch it this week, it's been a blurry week, um, <laughs> that's a public equity product, but that incorporates impact reporting. So you know, to us, having that kind of product that can be scalable, liquid, mainstream, very clear impact reporting so that not just institutional, but retail clients can really understand what it is they're getting. We think taking that lens of reporting, whether it's in green bonds or infrastructure, some private, a lot of public, is just something that we can bring to the sector that hopefully will continue to create, um, we think there's a lot of interest in both the retail and the institutional markets, but increasingly provide a framework that makes clients and investors more comfortable taking these opportunities to their investment committees or just talking about them among themselves in a way that they can start to think about in a mainstream way. And when we say mainstream, it's having holdings that can be in your core portfolio. It's not that sort of two to three percent of the of your portfolio that maybe you're allocating to niche investments. We think that what's going to help move these conversations is allowing investors to talk about it in their mainstream holdings. That's going to start to change, I think, what we're all going to be able to start to encounter in that conversation with investors. Well, and, and building on that and, and asking both of you, you know, some would argue, and this is San Francisco after all, um, that this is not impact investing going mainstream, that this is impact investing selling out. Um, so how do you defend against that potential critique uh, and specifically define impact as central to your strategy? How do you keep the bar high, um, either of you? Well, I, I'd start first, but I'm, you know, given my last job, I'm accustomed to being criticized no matter what I do. <laughs> if, I, if, if I walked on water, I used to say somebody would say, Patrick can't swim. <laughs> so I, I'm, I, look, people, there are lots of different ways to be engaged in impact investing. I don't, I want to make clear that from our perspective, the impact is not secondary. We screen for impact um, uh, uh, theoretically first, and then the financials. And when I talk about scale, I'm not just talking about scaling the financials, I'm talking about scaling the impact. What is it we do from this baseline to get us there? And Bank Capital's uh, uh, custom has been to be a very activist investor, very engaged in helping to build the company, and our anticipation is we'd be engaged on both of those uh, fronts or all of those fronts going forward. Second thing I'd say is that, uh, you know, in a way, um, you could see, I, and I do see impact investing as the natural um, extension of, or maybe the, uh, the articulation of a return to long-term value. Mm -hmm. We have a very short-term focused economy. Um, in the United States and in many parts of the world where we're managing quarter to quarter and sometimes getting those short-term returns, I think, without regard to the long-term uh, impact on the enterprise. Frankly, I think that has infected our politics as well, where we govern very much, you know, um, 
election cycle to election cycle or news cycle to news cycle and not generation to generation. If you think about the long-term value of an enterprise, um, that depends on more than one bottom line. Yes, the financial bottom line, but also environmental stewardship, the relationship with the community, the relationship with employees, and, uh, and a whole host of things that we think of um, sometimes, I think, mistakenly in our short-term economy as secondary to the money. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, we very much, we want to be very much about, uh, about uh, long-term value, and I think in that, in that respect, um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the impact investing um, field and, uh, and the patient capital or long-term uh, uh, value traditional investors are, are already aligned. They may not know it. Yeah, I, I'd like to echo what Deval just said because, you know, BlackRock has always been very much about the long-term investing. We have a CEO, Larry Fink, who I think is known globally for really reinforcing that long-term approach to investing. And in hand in hand with that is BlackRock's history of speaking to companies about their E, S, and G behavior. You know, what are they doing on the environment, social, governance? Because we have to vote all these shares. We need to make sure that they're behaving in a responsible way. So we do think that having this model, very much like Bain, of what is the financial impact? Let's be very clear about what that return is. And what is the non-financial or, you know, sort of the other impact that every investment in every company and every project is creating, good or bad? Yeah. In terms of your question about um, is this impact light or, you know, what, is it greenwashing? I think what we can do um, is, as I was saying before, be very clear about with every product and every opportunity what we're offering. If it's a screen, all we're doing is removing objectionable companies or industries that a client doesn't want in their portfolio. We're not calling that impact but we do think there's an element of responsible investing from a client's perspective, that's a solution we can offer. When we're talking about ESG products where we're looking at how a company behaves, we think that is also an element of responsible investing. We're not calling that impact, even though our name I know is BlackRock Impact, but you know, we're gonna be very clear with clients, this is what you're achieving, this is what you're accomplishing. And when we're talking about impact, we're talking about it in a way that I think is much more consistent with the way that it's been defined. But quite honestly, you know, to create something that gives broad access to lots of investors globally, and this, there is global demand for this, it's gonna look different. And as long as we can be clear about what it is we're putting on the table, knowing that it might, be, uh, it might have some characteristics that are similar to traditional impact, but also differences, I think that's our obligation, you know, not to just put this all under this uh, rubric or umbrella of impact, but be very clear what the trade-offs are and what it is we can deliver at scale. And when, you know, as, as Deval said, I don't manage or have anything to do with most of those trillions, um, but what BlackRock must do whenever it offers something, it needs to be scalable, and we need to be realistic about, uh, you know, what we can offer. But I do think that having this opportunity to direct such significant capital to opportunities where these issues are being articulated and you know, responsible investing and outcome-oriented um, conversations are happening is just a trend that's good for everyone. Yeah. And, and do either of you guys have a house view on some of the industry standards like the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board or GEARS? Are those things that are part of what you're thinking about putting together? Is yep. Uh, we love it all. Uh, you know, we, um, w at BlackRock, we're working on our own standards, and at the same time, we're looking at industry standards. Mm -hmm. And if there's an industry standard that can be as rigorous as we think is needed, we'll jump over to the industry standard. You know, from our point of view, the most valuable thing we can do is help create broad standards. What is green? You know, what is, uh, you know, when you talk about carbon intensity, what are we talking about? What is the measurement? Scope one, scope two, scope three. You know, mm -hmm. just always pushing back. I think the SASB is fantastic work. Anything that drives clear reporting and measurement is good for everyone. Yeah. So we're, um, you know, I, I think, I don't want to lump it all together, right. but we think every initiative that the industry is um, undertaking to try to drive to that kind of clarity is fantastic. Brian, our intention is to measure at the enterprise level, at the level of our buckets, if you will, and also at the, at the fund level. 
And we've gotten two kinds of feedback in talking to many of you in this, this room and in the, in the field. One is, please, please, please use a measure that's already in common use rather than inventing one of, of, uh, of your own so that there is some ability. Thank you to the six of you I spoke to about that. Um, there's some, so that there is some ability to, to compare yep. uh, with others who are doing comparable kinds of things on the private side. And the second is to, um, uh, is, uh, what is the second? I forgot the second. I'm having a, <laughs> right. I'm having a so recurring good. moment. What? The first one is so good. So good. It, so good. it trumps the second. Um, yeah, it does trump the second. Um, no, but the second is about um, not turning the enterprises in which we invest into data collection right. uh, enterprises. Let them have their business yeah. and run their, uh, their business. So let's get the data we can um, and that is meaningful yes. and that actually gives us insights into, into the movement on, uh, on the impact uh, side without being so burdensome about the, uh, about the detail that it becomes a distraction. I yeah. So go ahead. No, no. So I was going to say, I, I think we, we are... We are sort of trending toward um, Gears Iris um, uh, as uh, as measures. Very excited about SASB. There's a there's a gap kind of thing coming in this uh, in this field. Sounds like BlackRock and others are going to have a lot to do with helping to uh, to shape that, and that'll be good. Yeah, I think that um, you know you hope it's coming together. We look at something like green bonds, where there are a lot of conversations, and we're just pushing for the largest issuers to get around something that we can all adopt. When we look at infrastructure and we want metrics there, we're like, let's try to use whatever we can create um, in the green bond sector and use that in infrastructure. So I think that there's the more commonality, even across asset classes, and the greater the simplicity, which I think is something you were also driving out right. with the data, you want it to be meaningful, but you don't want it to be so complex that no one can understand it or use it. Right. So we think it's that intersection that you know, is really what we're, all, we're driving toward. Right. And finally, Deval, let me, let me close with you. You have a pretty long perspective of not only how markets evolve in this country, but also of how movements can catalyze and have catalyzed change in this country. Is impact investing a market or a movement? And where do you see this market slash movement heading over the next decade? Well, I think it's both, um, and I think that's not unusual in markets. Um, you know, the, uh, the most interesting thing is talking to endowment CIOs about their hesitation around impact investing um, when they are, when, uh, you know, I asked them, were you around when this new idea called private equity was invented? And they said, yeah, we were around and we did that, and somehow or other they figured out that could work. Um, I think, um, I think conscious capitalism is a powerful idea. And I think the notion that, um, and an important and timely idea. And I think it will grow. And it will be up to those of us in this room and rooms like it um, to spread the word and not, and not feel quite so um, jealous, and I say that lovingly, but quite so, so jealous about how, how great we feel about what we're doing in this room. We have to, we have to proselytize a little bit mm -hmm. about the importance of aligning our values uh, with, uh, with financial value. Um, if the planet is to be saved, if, uh, if communities are to, are to be uh, uh, uplifted, and frankly, if capitalism itself is to, is survive, is to survive. So my view is back to uh, what I was saying earlier. We've got to move to a more long-term um, way of thinking about economic uh, value, and when you think about it that way, social and environmental value are very much aligned. Right, well, that's very well said, and, and hopefully the, the large crowd here understands that these conversations are now happening within mainstream institutions, and so the conversation that we've been part of over the last decade is in fact now around the partnership table at Bain and in the senior leadership at BlackRock. So I want to thank you both for taking the time, uh, and welcome you to the impact investing industry, and we'll look forward to seeing you around at many SOCAPs Great. to come. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.